All right. Happy Back to the Future Day, October 21st, Wednesday. It's almost 10.15, so just thought I'd get going. Uh, the quizzes are graded. I realize that respiratory is hard, and there's a lot going on in this chapter, and so that's part of the reason why the scores drop, dropped off a little bit. But um, just be aware that I'm expecting you on these quizzes to have read and looked at the material prior, so that way you're not having to look up every answer. And therefore, while I did give some extended time, um, I think I was making it 35 or 40 minutes, uh, you shouldn't have, you should be able to get through all of the questions in that time frame. Um, and I know there's been some complaints to me about that, but um, I'm going to continue to press forward since, you know, you were given a little bit of extra time and it's uh, above, um, the 30 minutes that I initially had given, OK? On your test coming up, um, again, you need to be ready to go for lymphatics and respiratory. And then on your next online test, that digestion and metabolism test, you're going to need to be able to study prior. So that way, again, while you'll have about 60 minutes on the test, you don't have to spend the 60 minutes looking up every single answer. There should be some of them you can very quickly um, answer and move on, OK? And there are two essays on that test, so you do need to make sure you get to the essays at the end. OK, respiratory system. So last recording was all about ventilation. It was all about the gas laws. It's how we breathe. How do we trigger breathing? How do we trigger, um, or not how we trigger, that's a little bit of what we're going to do here. But once we trigger breathing, what's happening in the thoracic cage? How we're changing the thoracic volumes, and that's altering pressure, and then generating a gradient to pull air in. That's Boyle's law. And then Dalton's law came down to the changes that occur as air flows from the atmosphere into your mouth, into your lungs, when you add carbon dioxide, when you add residual volume and dead air space, and therefore the changes that occur with carbon dioxide and water pressure in the Dalton's equation, partial pressure, and how oxygen drops. The other side of Dalton's law is the air we're breathing. Remember that people on 100% oxygen or supplemental oxygen, so the tubes up their nose, they're not taking in compressed air. They're not taking in um, air with nitrogen at 78%, oxygen at 21%. They're actually taking in more oxygen-rich air. And so per Dalton's law, after you take out the 40 and 47 for water and carbon dioxide, you're going to still see increased oxygen content down to the alveoli. OK, and part of the reason why they're doing that at standard sea level conditions comes back to something's wrong with their surface area to um, blood ratio. Maybe they don't have all of their alveoli uh, getting ventilated. So there's more dead air space than, than there should be. And then because there's more dead air space, there's less surface area instead of a tennis court we're looking at, maybe half a tennis court worth of um, ventilation airflow to perfusion to blood flow that's available for gas blood interchange, OK? And so that was kind of the other part, all right? And then with Henry's law, um, Henry's law is when we start seeing when that partial pressure of oxygen would increase for, you know, a healthy person. That's not going to change the oxygen hemoglobin, because that's already at 98%. But that might put more oxygen to dissolve into the blood. And for a person, again, with, um, with problems, again, that higher partial pressure of oxygen is going to enhance maybe more of the hemoglobin binding. Uh, they're going to redistribute blood flow to those ventilated areas to get more of the hemoglobin binding. But it will also, again, lead to more diffusion um, of oxygen into the bloodstream, into the, the plasma as well, All right? And that's what hyperbaric medicine is all about, uh, and that high partial pressure of oxygen, that high pressure of oxygen, forcing more oxygen into the plasma is thought to have some healing properties with wound healing, with grafts, um, keeping grafts from being rejected, like skin grafts on the skin, and then post-cancer radiation healing. Uh, and so we would use that in a, um, in a, chem uh, in a um, clinical setting. Usually, most hospitals now have some type of hyperbaric medicine treatment facility in most of your big markets. And I bet you if you Googled it for St. Louis, there would probably be at least two places here that do some hyperbaric medicine. Okay. So 
We've talked about ventilation. We've talked about the gas laws. Now it's all about getting oxygen into the blood and the lungs, getting carbon dioxide out of the blood and the lungs, and then at the tissues for internal respiration, getting oxygen from the blood into the tissues, getting carbon dioxide from the tissues into the blood. All right, and so we know that oxygen and carbon dioxide are going to have some ability to be carried as a gas dissolved in the blood, but that's not a sufficient amount for our demands and for our need of getting carbon dioxide waste out and getting oxygen to the cells. So we have to have an alternative method to get more oxygen to cells from the atmosphere and more carbon dioxide from cells to the atmosphere. And so what we do is we utilize within the red blood cell some interactions and some enzymes and some protein binding to enhance our carrying capacity for both oxygen and carbon dioxide. All right, and we do this so that way uh, oxygen, most of it is bound to hemoglobin, a protein, and most of the red blood cell is hemoglobin, and so we have a lot of red blood cells, again, millions of them in a teardrop. We, in those red blood cells, we have millions and thousands of hemoglobin molecules, and each of those hemoglobin molecules binds a huge amount of oxygen particles, oxygen molecules, and helps carry them to our cells and then um, releases them. Right. So the re interactions need to be um, reversible and easily reversible, so therefore if we bind oxygen to hemoglobin, it's easy to take away oxygen from hemoglobin. And the same thing with carbon dioxide. Okay? So that's the big takeaway. Now, for oxygen, there's two ways it travels in our body. It travels in the blood water, per Henry's law, because of the partial pressure, some of it dissolves into the water of our body and is a gas in the water, okay? And that is a very small percentage. And so if we look at this chart, this represents that this represents that dissolved oxygen in the water of our body. Okay? So ninety eight percent of it, the rest of it is going to actually, because it's oxygen, because it's a gas that can go through fat, so it can pass through the membrane of this cell, the membrane of that cell, the membrane of this cell, the membrane of that cell, and the membrane of the red blood cell. And it can pass from fat and water, so it can go and diffuse all the way into the red blood cell. And in that red blood cell, this oxygen then can bind with hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. Okay, and hemoglobin has four binding sites, and it has an affinity to want to bind to oxygen. All right. Again, we enhance the oxygen by having a high amount of oxygen in our, in our air versus low amounts in the blood. Okay. So when we look at the partial pressure, it's 100 out here, right? And it's anywhere from 40 to 50. Or it can maybe even be lower, maybe it's 30 because you're exercising or something, okay? So we have a gradient. This distance that we make it cross is 5 microns, so we have a short distance. All of these things enhance very quickly oxygen moving from our air and our alveoli into our bloodstream, okay? All right, and we get most of it bound, and that helps keep pulling more oxygen into the blood. So therefore, we once we leave with this blood, this um, pulmonary veins, the partial pressure of oxygen is now equal to what it was in the alveoli. So that pulmonary oxygen partial pressure is now equal to what it was in the air of the alveoli. Right? Now, at the tissues, we do the exact same thing. We have a little bit larger area that the oxygen has to move, so it's not five microns, but we still have a low amount of oxygen in the cells because as quickly as the oxygen is taken up, it can be bound to other things. It can be utilized in a lot of different chemical processes, and that means that we have high partial pressure here, okay? I'm trying to write out high there, right? And we have low over here. We have Therefore, conditions that facilitate oxygen diffusing out. Again, this is fat, water, fat, water, oxygen still able to cross all of those um, different um, barriers easily because it's a small molecule that doesn't need a transporter, doesn't need a protein pore or anything like that. And hemoglobin is easily able to give up oxygen that's bound to it. 
All right, over here, carbon dioxide, so we have two ways to carry oxygen. We have three ways to carry carbon dioxide, okay? Some of it is going to be dissolved in the water. So just like over here, we have dissolved carbon dioxide, but not a lot of that is going to, um, it's not the most. It's actually the least amount. The other two ways carbon dioxide is carried is inside the red blood cell, it's going to undergo a chemical reaction combining into an acid. An acid, again, is, a, is a, um, some type of solution that when put in water donates a hydrogen ion. And so in this way, uh, this is how carbon dioxide is sometimes known as a body acid, even though there's not a hydrogen ion specifically in CO2's molecular structure. CO2 and water, when they are in high amounts, combine to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid becomes a hydrogen ion and a bicarb ion. And some of those hydrogen ions combine with hemoglobin with the extra space that hemoglobin now has because oxygen's vacated. All right. Some of your carbon dioxide gases can also directly bind to hemoglobin. This is the most efficient way, this whole molecular interaction of carbon dioxide and water becoming by um, carbonic acid. Uh, this is the next, the second best way. This is the worst way we carry uh, carbon dioxide in our bodies, okay? Now, one thing to note is when we bind the hydrogen to the hemoglobin, we have that uh, bicarb, that negative molecule, buffer molecule, and we actually do release that into our blood plasma, and that's part of the reason why blood plasma is 7.4. It's a little bit more basic than um, neutral, 7 water. Uh, and it's because it has this large car bar carbonate um, content and other buffers. And then the chlor there, though, and those buffers can help with like lactic acid, phosphatase, any other sulfuric acids, any other acids that are coming from the body from other mechanisms and purposes. Right? And in order to get the bicarb out of the red blood cell, a negative has to be exchanged for a negative. And this is going to lead to a chloride shift, which we will talk about a little bit later. Right? So, when we talk about we breathe, we got the air, we got that hundred, you know, partial pressure of oxygen to the alveoli. We hopefully have a tennis court worth of surface area of air-blood interchange. So because we have that surface area, because we have this gradient, because we have a small distance, we're able to quickly move oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. The oxygen coming in, most of it binds in the red blood cell to hemoglobin. A little bit of it stays in the plasma, the carbon dioxide. Most of it is in some way, shape, or form bound to hemoglobin or high Hydrogens and bicarb need to reconstitute into carbonic acid, then separate into water, carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide exits out, and then some carbon dioxide, again, is also in our water, okay? All right, so let's just focus a little bit more on this relationship of hemoglobin binding to oxygen. Remember, hemoglobin is four separate little amino acid chains, peptide chains. All right, and the four peptide chains come together. Each of them has a heme group. So each heme group has the ability to bind a molecule of oxygen, okay? And when a hemoglobin is saturated, that means it's binding four oxygens molecules, and that's O2, to each heme group, okay? Now, the ability of hemoglobin to bind an oxygen, all right, when it's completely empty, to bind the first oxygen is probably the most uh, challenging. So if we wanted to maybe bind this first oxygen, that's the most challenging of the binding to happen. Once hemoglobin has one oxygen bound, it's easier for the second oxygen to bound. Once there are two oxygen bound, then it's even easier for number three to bind. And then once we have three bound, the fourth is the easiest to combine. So, reverse that. When we have a hemoglobin with four binding sites occupied with oxygen, it's very easy to take one away, okay? So when your cells are pulling oxygen off hemoglobin, they're usually pulling off one of the oxygens pretty easily on every single helium, uh, hemoglobin molecule. And so when we look at, like, um, the venous blood, and we say it's only 90% saturated, that means that of all of our hemoglobins, all right, 90% of them 
or is maintaining at least three to four saturation sites. And the, the open sites are usually one on each hemoglobin molecule that's not 100% saturated. Okay. So we manipulate this ability of the ability for hemoglobin to bind and hold oxygen is enhanced when one or more are bound to it as a way to better facilitate oxygen hemoglobin coming on in the lungs and making that fourth binding site and then oxygen giving up, um, hemoglobin giving up an oxygen at the tissues. Okay. When we really have stress and we really start pulling maybe two oxygens off of the molecule, Right, so maybe we're taking two. That still is going to be um, okay because we still have two bound. And so those two bound will still somewhat facilitate oxygen binding at the lungs and still facilitate one or two oxygen release at the um, at the tissues. What we really want to avoid is our hemoglobin completely becoming desaturated, completely giving up all of its oxygen. Because when it doesn't have any oxygen, at all, it's the most difficult to get that first oxygen bound to it. Okay? So when you look at a hemoglobin saturation curve, all right, what we're seeing in this curve is that when we have low amounts of oxygen available, that means our hemoglobin is usually, all of our hemoglobin are binding about one oxygen per molecule. And you can see that, again, it's very difficult to get and hold that one oxygen. As the partial pressure increases, what we see is once hemoglobin maybe gets one or two oxygens bound, right, one to two, that it becomes easier to then get a third oxygen, and then it's really easy to gain or lose that fourth oxygen molecule, and that's what the curve up here is showing you. So over here, as long as most of the hemoglobins have at least three oxygens, it's very easy to give a fourth up or gain a fourth, okay? So that's part of the reason why this curve looks like it does. Easy to gain a fourth, give up a fourth, a little bit easier to gain and give up a third, very difficult to gain and give up one out of two, and then extremely difficult to try to give up that single oxygen, all right? Okay, the other thing to take away is, again, most of us healthy, normal people breathing normal air conditions, our alveolar partial pressure of oxygen is 100. 100 partial pressure equates to 98% saturation or 97% saturation. Again, what you're saying is that for a given second, a given period of time, all of your hemoglobin heme binding sites are physically touching, attaching to an oxygen molecule except for 1 to 2 percent. And that 1 to 2 percent might actually be just because molecules bind, disconnect, bind, disconnect, bind, disconnect. For that given second, you have some oxygen hemoglobin that have disconnected for a fraction of a second. Because molecules are in constant motion, so they're constantly bind, reconnect, bind, reconnect, bind, disconnect, bind, disconnect, okay? All right. The other thing to take away is that as long, because as long as we keep three oxygens bound to most of our hemoglobin, we can actually see partial pressure of oxygen drop to somewhere around 60, okay? And that's about 10, 12,000 feet in altitude. So we can actually see some pretty big changes in the oxygen content getting to our alveoli. Uh, maybe even handle, like a smoker, some small changes instead of like um, all the tennis court, maybe we only lost a, um, a quarter of the tennis court. So we're still three quarters of a tennis court worth of surface area blood interaction, right? So what this is basically saying is we can tolerate some small changes to surface area ventilation. We can tolerate some changes to our atmosphere and our pressure of oxygen available and maintain pretty decent saturation levels and not be hypoxic. Again, hypoxia is defined as insufficient oxygen to meet demands of a tissue. And insufficient oxygen in the brain means maybe you're not thinking clearly, you're not comprehending your surroundings, you're not aware, um, alert of what's going on. 
right? Not sufficient amount of oxygen in a muscle means the muscle might start to not be able to uh, stay under voluntary control. It might start twitching. It might actually not work at all because there's not enough ATP to make enough actin myosin cross bridging interactions for you to actually then control your muscles so you can become paralyzed. Right? And again, we are considered mildly hypoxic when our pH or when our saturations are under 90. We are severely hypoxic at 70. Okay? So while it's a pretty decent hold, all right, to some changes in partial pressure, we maintain mostly saturated. It's a very slippery slope once we start losing that third and that second oxygen where we can potentially be incapacitated, alert, aware, but not really aware because we're hypoxic and unable to control our body and then very quickly to pass out um, once we get into some low pro partial pressures. Okay. Now, this oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve, we influence it at the lungs and we influence it at the blood tissue interaction to either facilitate binding of oxygen to hemoglobin or facilitate oxygen release from hemoglobin. And we can change protein, protein interactions, protein molecule interactions by changing some of the conditions around that protein. Right? One of the conditions you can change are pH. Just like proteins denature, proteins change with heat, proteins denature and change when pH is altered out of a certain comfort zone for that protein. And it goes back to chemistry. We change peptide bonds. We change ionic bonds. We change hydrogen bonding. And all of those bonds are part of what makes a protein primary, secondary, tertiary, quadriary structure. And so what we see is 7.4 is what normal blood is normally. So this purple line here represents our normal oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve. What we see is if the pH becomes more acidic, and pH would become more acidic because we have increased carbon dioxide levels. And typically we have increased carbon dioxide levels at our tissue. What we see is more carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide binding with water, forming carbonic acid, carbonic acid disassociating into hydrogen ions and bicarbons. So more hydrogen ions means more concentration of hydrogen ions in that solution. pH, the scale, becomes 7.4, goes down to 7.2, and we become acidic in that area of the body. That acidity is going to change how hemoglobin and oxygen bind to each other. And it's going to change hemoglobin's little, you know, hydrogen bonding, some of its ionic bonding, some of its features of its primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. And that is going to facilitate the ability for oxygen to disassociate and stay unbound to hemoglobin. And so what happens when we are acidic is we see what's known as a right shift of the hemoglobin saturation curve. And a right shift means at higher partial pressures, okay, we are not as saturated. So we would be at 80 instead of 97% saturated, we could be down at 90% saturated. So what this means is when we see high acidity, when we see high, number, high levels of carbon dioxide, when we see high amounts of lactic acid, when we see high amounts of keto acids, Again, all of these conditions that can be acidity, acid-forming reasons in our body, we are going to facilitate oxygen not staying bound to hemoglobin. And if it's at the tissues, maybe that oxygen will now be available for those cells to be able to make more ATP, utilize and make more carbon dioxide, and meet its demands um, that it's having to, to generate. Okay. So typically, we see higher carbon dioxide levels, higher acidity at tissues, at exercising tissues in particular, because not only do we see more carbon dioxide as we're breaking down glucose and fat, we see more lactic acid because maybe the oxygen isn't meeting those demands. So a right shift of our hemoglobin saturation curve in relationship to pH should be expected and hoped for in our bodies at the cell level, at the cell blood interaction, so that way we get higher amounts of oxygen released from the hemoglobin to the tissues. Okay? On the flip side of that, all right, in the lungs, 
we would expect that carbon dioxide is coming part of our atmosphere, okay? So we would expect that as soon as hydrogen and bicarb can become carbonic acid, it becomes carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide leaves and becomes part of the air in the alveoli, becomes part of the atmosphere, is being exhaled out. Okay? So we expect that the hydrogen ion concentration to actually decrease. And as hydrogen ion concentrations decrease, we expect pH to maybe come up a little bit. And so we would actually expect in our lungs to see a little bit of a left shift of this hemoglobin curve. And that left shift of the hemoglobin curve is going to mean that even at lower pHs, so let's say you have less surface area, or let's say you have um, maybe you're 10,000 feet or 8,000 feet, you would be able to facilitate Instead of at um, 75 partial pressure for oxygen being bound at 80%, you're now at 90%. Okay? So this condition of manipulating pH, we actually see this happening uh, in our bodies, and we utilize it to help facilitate more oxygen binding to hemoglobin and staying bound to hemoglobin in the lungs with a left shift. And we see the increased acidity, increased carbon dioxide levels, increased lactic acid levels, and exercising muscles, all of those things him, uh, helping to make acidity increase, which then causes hemoglobin to give up more oxygen and make more oxygen available under higher pressure, partial pressures of oxygen to the tissues. And as some of you pointed out in the quiz, when we see um, the saturation of oxygen drop because of pH getting increased and there's more hydrogen ions available, so there's more acidity. That is known as the Bohr effect, and we see that in our tissues, especially with exercising muscles. Okay? So pH levels are going to be affected. So if your kidneys are not working and you can't get rid of your acid, that is potentially going to alter your whole body pH, and we'll go through that more with urinary. Anytime someone who's diabetic and is not getting glucose in their system and they're making high amounts of keto acids and is becoming metabolically acidotic, that potentially is going to affect their oxygen hemoglobin saturation and affect their, you know, oxygen carrying capacity to their body. So that's why they can maybe act a little crazy when they become ketoacidotic. Okay, so anything that changes the acidity of our body, whether it's respiratory or metabolic in nature, can alter hemoglobin oxygen carrying capacity. And we manipulate it ourselves to enhance oxygen onload, oxygen offload. All right, let's look at temperature, because again, temperature, all right, and this is just the equation there, okay? Temperature is another way that makes proteins change their shape a little bit. Right? Increased temperature means molecules move faster and generate maybe a little bit more space and a little bit more changing to the hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, and peptide bonding. Colder temperatures mean the, the molecules vibrate, move less, and so they're going to be more stable and maybe even more compact. So what we see is hemoglobin, like any other protein, is going to be um, sensitive to changes in temperature. Normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. That's 98 degrees. So again, our blood runs a little warmer. So the orange line represents the normal hemoglobin saturation curve. And what we find is a right shift, like the Bohr effect, occurs when temperature increases. All right? And we facilitate increasing temperature at muscle cells when they exercise. Because as they exercise and they burn ATP, they are breaking phosphate, phosphate bonds. You're utilizing energy, but not all of the energy. So there's more heat being um, released because it's unutilized fuel from a broken bond or unutilized energy. All right? So when we see muscles exercising, we know our temperature in those cells is increasing. And that increased temperature is going to facilitate, again, in the red blood cells and the hemoglobin flowing through that tissue, that hemoglobin is going to, at high partial pressures, give up oxygen to the surrounding environment. So exercising tissue, it has lactic acid, has high carbon dioxide, it's acidic, that's right shifting the curve. That's the Bohr effect. Exercising muscle has more temperature, more heat in that area. That's facilitating even more of a right shift on the curve. So exercising muscle cells are getting 
as much oxygen off that hemoglobin curve as they possibly can by causing in two mechanisms a right shift on the hemoglobin saturation curve. Okay? And conversely, cold temperatures would do the opposite. Right? So that's what's going on with temperature. The last way we alter the hemoglobin saturation curve is going to be in the red blood cells. So it has nothing to do with the cells and the tissues outside of the red blood cell. It's in the red blood cell. Okay? The red blood cell, no mitochondria. Thus, if it needs to make ATP to run any kind of system within its you know, cell, it needs to make ATP by taking glucose and converting it to pyruvate. That process is known as glycolysis. Glycolysis is not just glucose cut in half. It actually is an 8 to 10 step process. Okay? And in the process of doing that, we are going to make a molecule known as 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 1,3. So at this point, we had 1,6 fructose 1,6 biphosphate. So we had a phosphate on the 6 carbon, a phosphate on the 1 carbon. We break it in half. We're left with a molecule that still has a phosphate on the one carbon, and we have none on the third. This molecule now has no phosphate on the one carbon, one on the third. What we need to do is we need to convert this to this. We want to get two molecules with a phosphate on the one carbon. So to do that, we actually add phosphates, use this phosphate here to eventually generate ATP, and then eventually we take the phosphate away, okay? All right, that's biochemistry. I don't really care that you know that, but I want you to know that at one point in time, we end up with 1,3-biphosphoglycerates. We end up with a three-molecule carbon with phosphates on the 1 and the 3. Now, one of the things that can happen is the phosphate can move from the 1 carbon to the 2 carbon, and we can end up with 2 Three bisphosphoglycerate, and we can do that when we start to have kind of backlog. So when this starts to get backlogged, and we start to accumulate too much one three bisphosphoglycerate. Okay, so when we start to get too much bisphosphoglycerate, we're going to start making two three bisphosphoglycerate. Right. Now, in order to make 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, you have to have glucose. You have to have a red blood cell that has glucose. So what we're going to see is older red blood cells are not going to have as much biphosphoglycerate because they don't have enough glucose to make into all of these intermediates. Okay? And we're going to see that as red blood cells make energy through glycolysis, they accumulate 1,3-biphosphoglycerate, and they then accumulate more 2,3-biphosphoglycerate, and those higher concentrations of 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate are going to cause, like pH becoming 7.2, like our temperature increasing to 43 degrees Celsius, it's going to cause a right shift in the curve that is going to, at... Um, Higher, constant, higher partial pressures of oxygen lead to release of oxygen from hemoglobin to the tissues. Okay? On the converse side, if the red blood cell does not have a lot of 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate and other bisphosphoglycerate molecules, that means it's old and it's run through a lot of its glucose that it had stored up initially, that means we're not going to see that shift and we're not going to be as easily facilitating the release of oxygen to the cells in the body. Okay? So one of the things we look for with old red blood cells is we're looking for you know, are they deformed? Do they have damage on their membrane? And do they have high levels or low levels of 2,3-biphosphoglycerate and biphosphoglycerate intermediates? And if they have low amounts, that could be another way to indicate to macrophages in the um, spleen and the liver to ingest macrophage and eat and remove that red blood cell from circulation. Okay? All right, so three things, again, influence hemoglobin because it changes hemoglobin protein nature structure. pH, temperature, and then in the red blood cell, the presence of glycolysis intermediaries, intermediates, inter in particular, this biphosphoglycerate. Okay? And we facilitate 
all of these conditions to our advantage to make oxygen release at the tissues by having high carbon dioxide, a little more acidity, a little more temperature there, and we facilitate the onload and binding of oxygen to hemoglobin in the lungs by, again, getting rid of the carbon dioxide so the acidity goes away and actually becomes more basic. And the temperature there can be less because it can be cooler with the air coming in from the outside environment. Now, you actually have two separate hemoglobin molecules in your genes. You have a fetal hemoglobin gene and you have a, an adult hemoglobin gene. And what we see is that the fetal hemoglobin gene has a different binding curve than our adult hemoglobin gene. And the reason why it's different is the fetal hemoglobin gene needs to have the ability to bind oxygen at lower partial pressures than the adult. And the reason why is the fetus is not breathing air. The fetus is getting blood from mom. Fetus, instead of getting oxygen from air, has to pull oxygen from mom. So what the fetus has to do is have a hemoglobin, have a molecule of protein in their blood that is capable of binding oxygen with more affinity under lower partial pressures than what mom's blood can do. And so what we see is that fetal hemoglobin is actually a very sharp left shift of the curve. So when the blood of the baby is seeing uh, mom's venous blood, which is somewhere around a partial pressure of 50, mom is likely to let some of those oxygens disassociate from her hemoglobin. And those oxygens are then available to then be picked up and saturate and bind to the hemoglobin molecules within baby's blood, okay? Now, when you're born, you turn off that gene, you stop expressing that gene, you stop making hemoglobin for a fetus, and you start making adult hemoglobin. If you ever get cancer and cells become cancerous and start acting inappropriate, one of the genes that they can start to turn on and start to make proteins is this fetal hemoglobin gene. And so if cancer starts making fetal hemoglobin proteins in the cancer cells, that is going to facilitate, as blood moves by that cancer cell and that cancer tumor, that's going to facilitate oxygen being bound into the cancer cell and staying in the cancer cell and not then being present and available for healthy cells. And that's one of the telltale signs that you have a pretty bad aggressive cancer is that it's, a, it's expressing fetal hemoglobin and stealing even more oxygen from your bloodstream and hoarding it for its own use rather than letting the body continue to do things. So this is just to rehash what we said earlier. How is carbon dioxide carried or transported in the blood? Three ways. One, it is dissolved per Henry's law into the plasma. And 7% of your carbon dioxide, so if you have 100 molecules of carbon dioxide, seven of them are going to stay in the plasma in the water as a dissolved gas. Right? If carbon dioxide partial pressure increases, more would be able to be retained you know, retains, but, you know, on average, it's about 7%, okay? That means out of 100 molecules, 93 carbon dioxide molecules move into the red blood cell. Of those 93 molecules, 23 are going to bind to hemoglobin binding sites that oxygen has vacated. The rest of them, 70, are going to undergo water is in this cell, Water and carbon dioxide are going to combine and become um, your carbonic acid. And then carbonic acid happens more because there's the enzyme that facilitates this reaction known as carbonic anhydrase. So your red blood cell has all the enzymes for, gluco for glucose conversion to pyruvate glycolysis. It's got huge, huge, huge amounts of hemoglobin. And it's got a small little protein population of carbonic anhydrase. And this carbonic anhydrase helps make carbon dioxide and water into carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, there's still water here. And as an acid in water, it wants to disassociate, and it becomes a hydrogen and a bicarb. Some of those hydrogens are going to bind to buffers. Right? Buffers can be some proteins, some amino acids, so it can bind to hemoglobin, it can bind to other proteins, it can bind to other amino acids. 
or it can just, again, change somewhat the pH of the cell water. Right? The bicarb is going to exit so it can be part of the buffers out here in the plasma and help with, you know, lactic acid and other acids that might be in the blood. And in order for bicarb to leave, a negative has to come in, and that's chloride. And that's known as the chloride shift. Okay? All right. When we look at respiratory regulation, okay, we want to regulate things locally, and then we want to regulate things through the nervous system. Okay, so some of our changes of how we're going to regulate the respiratory system are going to occur because cells are going to make some small changes in the local area that are going to, you know, make oxygen more available or less available by changing blood flow. And then the lungs can potentially change how we ventilate and how we perfuse the lungs to best match fresh air, fresh ventilated airs to best blood flow areas of the lungs. The neural control is going to be, all right, we're, we're trying to get oxygen to the tissues. We know that we need to maybe breathe more air per minute, so change frequency, or we need to change the amount of air, the volume of air coming into and out of the lungs in a period of time. So that means we need to change the contraction of the diaphragm, the intercostals, the accessories, and the relaxation to get the volume to maybe increase, decrease. And we need to change the frequency, which means we need to change the phrenic nerve firing on these muscles. And all of those things can be controlled in involuntary ways through the medulla and some of the pons, and then through voluntary mechanisms by upper, higher level brain centers in the cerebral cortex. Okay, so let's go through a little bit more detail. All right. You are becoming hypoxic. Your cells are not getting enough oxygen, or they're seeing oxygen partial pressures that is insufficient to meet their demand, so partial pressure of oxygen is decreasing, and the carbon dioxide partial pressures are increasing because they're making energy and they're making a lot of glucose and fat into energy and they're giving off a lot of carbon dioxide. These changes at a cell where oxygen partial pressure is decreasing and carbon dioxide partial pressure is increasing is going to make that cell want to alter blood flow. It's going to make that cell want to trigger the arterial to dilate. By triggering the arterial to dilate, more blood flows in, more blood, hopefully, that's oxygen rich, so the partial pressure of oxygen in that area will go up, and the blood will leave and take away more of that carbon dioxide. Okay? So that's what's going on. And you see this when cells, again, uh, start acti acti exercising, you know, your muscles. As they start pulling more oxygen in and utilizing it to generate ATP to exercise, the partial pressure of oxygen decreases, the carbon dioxide contents increasing, lactic acid contents decreasing. That's going to cause changes at the arterial. More blood will come in, redistribute some of the cardiac output, but the partial pressure of oxygen will come up as more blood, oxygen-rich blood, comes into that area. Okay. And the carbon dioxide levels will go down as the blood takes, more blood is taking away more carbon dioxide. All right? Now, in the lungs, again, the lungs want to best match whatever is being ventilated. The areas that are getting fresh air, getting some of that tidal volume into the alveoli, they want to send blood to that area. And if you have areas of the lungs where you do not have uh, air being changed, so you have dead air space, you have basically maybe damaged areas of the alveoli that are no longer going to get fresh air, the last thing the lungs want to do is send blood to those alveoli. So what happens is areas of the lungs that are seeing that higher partial pressure of oxygen in the surrounding tissues are going to then see dilation and blood flow directed to those air sacs. And then any air sacs that are seeing partial pressures of oxygen that are really low, meaning they're not getting any of the tidal volume mixed with the dead space air, so they're mostly just that residual dead volume air, they're not going to want, the lungs don't want to send blood to those air sacs because it's not going to be beneficial at picking up oxygen. Okay. So what we see then, and this picture shows you, is 
alveoli, for the most part, that are getting high amounts of oxygen, right, high partial pressures of oxygen, are going to get blood supply. And places where there's no alveolar air interactions with blood, we are going to try not to send blood or as much blood to those areas. Okay. And then in the cases of when we start to, let's say with smoking, start to see some alveoli get damaged, get overinflated, or get you know to a place where they no longer receive fresh air, we're going to see even more robust changes to the capillaries to those alveoli by constricting and sending blood away from them and instead sending blood to well-ventilated areas. Right? And ultimately, if let's say a large portion of our lungs start to have this happening, this could lead to the increase in pulmonary hypertension, because if, the, if there's a lot of these vessels constricting, that could potentially lead to a lot of afterload on the right heart and eventually increasing in pulmonary pressure, so pulmonary hypertension develops, and that can eventually lead to even right heart failure. Okay? Whereas over here, um, you know, if this is just happening to a few places, we can tolerate this pretty easily, and so it shouldn't see big effects on our um, end result of what is our oxygen saturation, so our PO2 going to the left heart for systemic blood. It might be if, let's say, you smoke and let's say you've lost 10% of your lungs to dead airspace damage from the smoking. Instead of, let's say, you're at 98%, uh, which would be a normal, healthy person with 100% lung capacity, you might be down to, again, because of the hemoglobin ox oxygen curve, because of this redistribution of blood to oxygen rinse environments, maybe you're only down to 93% of your um, of your hemoglobin saturation curve. And so, therefore, you're still pretty okay and not very hypoxic. Okay? But, Ultimately, this is what gets people who smoke, ultimately they end up with um, lung disease because as the larger portions, larger surface area, larger amounts of their lungs become like this, this number goes from 10% to 20% to 30% to 40%. Their pulmonary hyperpressure pressure increases, leading them to right heart failure, so that's cardiovascular implications. And the blood going to the left heart as more and more area is lost to dead air space becomes less oxygenated and they become hypoxic. And um, systemic blood O2 saturation is less even under normal standard healthy conditions for most healthy people. Okay. Now, the neuro side, all right? So you have an area of your brain that controls your respiratory center in the medulla, and it's known as the cardiorespiratory center. And it's going to make you breathe that frequency of between 12 to 18 times a minute. And it is going to be influenced by lots of different things. Okay? It's going to be influenced by upper regions of the pons, upper regions of the brain. And those upper regions of the brain are going to cause that res respiratory center to maybe breathe less per minute or breathe more per minute, okay? Now, what is going to help give feedback on if the medulla and the pons and these upper respiratory regions, voluntary regions of the brain are being effective at delivering oxygen to the blood is going to come back to some reflexing control mechanisms, all right? And some of these reflexing control mechanisms are going to be, are we getting blood out of the heart that is oxygen rich, the right amount of carbon dioxide, and because of the right amount of carbon dioxide, the right pH. If our blood that we are breathing per minute is not oxygen rich, and in fact carbon dioxide rich and maybe acidic, we are going to see changes because of those chemical content of our blood, we're going to see changes to our breathing rate. Okay? Now, Chemoreceptors, we have the peripheral chemoreceptors, which are located right at the points where the left ventricle is pushing blood into the aorta, and then right where the blood is heading to the brain, because you want oxygen-rich blood going to your brain, and it's pretty close to the left ventricle. 
So these are two spots where peripherally we can see if we're delivering from the left heart to the body oxygen rich carbon dioxide perfect blood and acidity wise perfect blood. We also have a chemoreceptor in the brain right next to the medulla and that chemoreceptor only is sensitive to changes in carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide's effect on the brain because carbon dioxide is one of those molecules that can get past the blood brain barrier and get into the interstitial fluid, the extracellular fluid around the neurons as a hydrogen ion. So the best molecule to actually control and regulate breathing is actually carbon dioxide. And the reason why is because we measure it in a central chemoreceptor in the brain as well as peripherally. And we do not tolerate big changes in carbon dioxide, right? Because big changes in carbon dioxide lead to big changes in pH, and we don't want to see big changes in pH. We want to be 7.35 to 7.45 on our blood. Nothing more, nothing less. So the reasoning that carbon dioxide and thus hydrogen ions are going to be our most potent way to alter breathing rate is because we don't want to see big swings in carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions, and we have two places we're regulating that. Okay? Now, oxygen can influence breathing rate but it's going to take big changes in the partial pressure of oxygen because, again, we tolerate small changes in partial pressure of oxygen, even some bigger changes with our hemoglobin saturation curve and because we really only are measuring carb oxygen levels in the um, peripheral receptors. Okay? Now, while the blood pressure, the stretch of the baroreceptors is not directly telling us if we're sending oxygen rich or carbon dioxide right amount, you know, blood to the tissues. It is at least telling us if we're getting enough cardiac output to the tissues. So while we're not technically going to um, measure oxygen content with baroreceptors, by using our baroreceptors and keeping an eye on blood pressure and stretch in the aorta and in the, um, and in the carotids, we're still able to kind of tell, OK, we're delivering a sufficient amount of blood and then kind of intuitively, hopefully, a sufficient amount of oxygen in that blood to our tissues, right? Now, the lungs, we talked about compliance. The lungs are going to have some reflexes built in that can change respiratory rate. Those reflexes are going to be related to the lungs want to not be overstretched because that will damage them and potentially, you know, mess with their elastin recoil capabilities. So stretch receptors in the lungs are going to prevent us from overstretching and are going to pot potentially try to send signals to the medulla to change how we're breathing. So instead of maybe taking too many deep breaths, maybe make shallow breathing instead. Right? And the point would be to not damage the lungs by overstretching them. Other reflexes in the lungs are related to irritants. We might not want to breathe certain chemicals, certain things that could cause damage to the epithelial lining or to the alveolar lining or to the blood or to our bodies. And so therefore, any of those chemicals will usually cause us to change the way we breathe as an attempt to not let those chemicals maybe get into the deeper regions of the lung. And then we have other changes that can cause breathing rate, like anxiety, you start to see pain, people start kind of, when they're in a lot of pain, they're, um, they're maybe breathing shallow breaths, uh, and even abnormal temperatures and visceral sensations, okay? So all of those things will lead to changes in respiratory rate, changes in respiratory volume, okay? And that all kind of comes back to, per this graph, here's the medulla. So medulla is getting influence from the brain, upper areas of the brain, from pain receptors, temperature receptors, places, again, involuntary things in the brain, okay? And it's taking most of that information and setting our firing rate to be 12 to 18 breaths a minute, 500 milliliters of tidal volume, right? If things are coming to the 
medulla that say the 12 to 18 breaths is not sufficient because it's not carrying the right amount of oxygen, carbon dioxide, it's not delivering the right amount of oxygen to the tissues, it's um, maybe not enough stretch or it's too much stretch, the medulla then alters our breathing rate, alters the breathing uh, volume, the pressure changes to try to fix and get everything back into normal homeostatic conditions. Okay, so just to be a little bit more on the chemoreceptor reflexes, carbon dioxide is going to be our most potent way to regulate breathing rate because small changes in carbon dioxide, bad things related to body and pH levels, proteins denaturing, things going wrong. Okay, again, this is our medulla, our our breathing center, apneustic center. The apneustic center is going to influence, again, the medulla, this region, and this respiratory control center, right? You also have a stop breathing center here for um, pneumotaxic center, right? So the medulla is here. The medulla gets influence from certain cranial nerves, bringing information from the baroreceptors, the carotid receptors, the um, aortic sinuses and all of those chemoreceptors, right? The sensory chemoreceptors, the central chemoreceptors are getting influenced on carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion content in the brain, right? And you have higher centers getting information. The medulla then sends either the stimulus to contract down the phrenic nerve or the stimulus to not contract down the phrenic nerve. So it sets the frequency that the phrenic nerve is going to send to the diaphragm, and then other motor neurons to the intercostals to set breathing rate, breathing volume, okay? More frequency, increase intensity, um, increase recruitment, more motor neurons, more volume, more strength of contraction, more pressure changes, more tidal volume, frequency, more breaths per minute. Again, how does it work in the central chemoreceptor? Carbon dioxide as a gas has the ability, unlike most things, to cross the blood-brain barrier and get into cerebral spinal fluid and circulate throughout the cerebral spinal fluid ventricles, throughout the arachnoid, subarachnoid space of the brain, and even can get into the um, interstitial fluid of certain areas of the brain. Okay. And when it gets into the water of the cerebral spinal fluid, just like it does in the red blood cell, in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, an enzyme, a protein, carbon dioxide and water combine to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid disassociates into bicarb and hydrogen ions, and hydrogen ions can interact with the chemoreceptors. Okay? Now, you shouldn't see the breathing rate increase with the chemoreceptor if the hydrogen content of our blood is not because of high levels of carbon dioxide, but because of other reasons. So this is why carbon dioxide, and not just pH, is the biggest potent chemical change um, for breathing. Okay? All right. So again, if we see that homeostasis is disturbed, because of increased PCO2 levels, we are going to see that increased PCO2 is going to mean more partial pressure of carbon dioxide and cerebral spinal fluid. It's going to undergo that reaction, lead to more hydrogen ions to interact with central chemoreceptors. That is going to tell the medulla and specifically the respiratory center of the medulla to increase the firing of the phrenic nerve and the other motor neurons that control inspiratory muscles. That p increased PCO2 at the arterial carotid and aorta are going to also lead to more stimulation of higher hydrogen ion concentration, higher PCO2 levels. That is going to also feed back through cranial nerves to the dorsal respiratory group of the medulla telling, again, increased respiratory rate. If I increase my respiratory rate from 12 to 18 to 22, I'm taking more breaths a minute, interacting more air into the alveoli, so carbon dioxide hopefully is diffusing more rapidly into that air and out to the atmosphere. As it leaves more, it will decrease and homeostasis is recovered.
if let's say I've stopped exercising or I'm sleeping and I'm not making as much carbon dioxide, my metabolism is slowing down, I might see less carbon dioxide in my body. Less carbon dioxide means less carbon dioxide getting into the cerebral spinal fluid, less hydrogen ions, so I don't need to stimulate as breathing as quickly. I also am not going to see my arterial chemoreceptors respond as much because, again, there's less carbon dioxide. And I will see potentially reduction in my breathing rate. I can even see cessation, meaning stop breathing entirely. And you see this with people who hyperventilate. They breathe, so you're hyperventilate, so you're, like, you're breathing out, you're breathing out so much carbon dioxide that your pH becomes high and it becomes high in the cerebral spinal fluid of your brain, high in your body, that you stop breathing, so therefore carbon dioxide levels can accumulate back towards normal. And that's the big danger with people who swim and scuba dive and hyperventilating. Because what they do is they can hyperventilate, cause themselves to pass out underwater, wake up. The first thing you want to do when you wake up is take a big breath and you're underwater and you can end up breathing water and drown. And that's why scuba diving and hyperventilation, bad. Okay. All right, the baroreceptors, again, the, the, the idea is if I'm delivering the right amount of blood, cardiac output per minute to the tissues, I should be distributing enough carbon, um, carbon dioxide oxygen content. So if I'm not meeting cardiac output, if I'm not meeting my blood pressure, then I potentially am not sending enough sufficient blood to tissues and not then meeting maybe their oxygen demands, carbon dioxide taking away. Okay. And then the other side was all of those reflexes related to protecting the lungs from being exposed to vapors, chemical irritants, things that we don't want getting into our bloodstream, or even protecting the, um, the lungs from being overstretched. Okay. Again, we have some, some voluntary control, but anything that's voluntary can be overridden if we, like we've been hyperventilating, if we screw up the blood gases too much, the body will make us pass out, make us remove voluntary control, try to reset, and then come back to involuntary control. Okay, so there are limits. Okay. Again, at birth, we want to see the lungs fill with air, and that's a very important part of birth, and that's one of the big things with preemies, making sure that the preemie can breathe on their own, otherwise getting them on an incubator, getting them that artificial surfactant so they don't go into respiratory distress and have collapsed lungs. So before the fetus is born, remember the, the lungs are just full of fluid, the oxygen is not really being dissolved into the blood by the pulmonary system, but at birth we need to see the first breath inflates the lungs, causes pulmonary vessels to uh, increase in their blood flow to the lungs, and then we need to close those holes in the lungs and scar over those holes so we end up with two separate pumps, a right pump and a left pump. Okay. And if something happens and nothing closes, that, that's a problem. We now know we can do surgery on the most, most of these things. Um, and if, if, the, if that's not the problem, like with respiratory distress, we can try to facilitate with um, surfactant and with ventilators and, you know, changing um, breathing rates and volumes to try to keep the baby alive until they can start to make their own surfactant. Okay. All right, so the last part of this chapter is, so with time, what happens to this organ system? With time, like every tissue, fibroblasts, connective tissue is going to be less um, robust, less elastic -y, less strong. And in the lungs, that decrease in connective tissue and decrease specifically in the elastic properties of the membrane is going to mean compliance of the lung is going to come down, meaning you're not going to be able to open the lungs as big, so you're not going to be able to generate as much pressure gradient and bring as much air in, and conversely, you're not going to be able to collapse the lungs as much and force as much air out, All right? So that's one part of it. The other part of it is, like all bodies, we have potentially arthritis that can develop, um, whether it's by 
osteoarthritis, just bone, bone, interchange, wear and tear, or rheumatic, rheumatic arthritis of the inflammation occurring in a joint. Either way, that could limit the ability of the bone, muscle, cartilage of the ribs to open and not. And then the diaphragm is a muscle, and it, it can get weaker with age. So it could not work as well. So just by itself, like with all connective tissues, like with even our skin, as we age, we're going to not be able to generate as much Boyle's Law, as much pressure volume changes in the lungs. And that means as we age, we're going to move less air. And so we might see with age, our respiratory rate just kind of creep up a little bit. Instead of being 12 breaths at rest, maybe we're at 15 or 16 breaths at rest. Okay? However, this is going to be worse for anyone that gets exposure to toxins or things that exacerbate the breakdown of connective tissue, the breakdown of alveolar tissue, um, and causes potentially that compliance to be more robustly damaged, and even the amount of lung space to more robustly be damaged. But the takeaway of all this is, on this red chart, is if you smoke and if you ever stop, the earlier you stop, of course, the better, but if you ever stop, you can recover some of that uh, connective tissue as long as there's fibroblasts, again, as long as you're young enough and have fibroblasts to lay down in that younger connective tissue, some of those elastic proteins to recuperate some of that compliance. Okay? So the takeaway is don't smoke because that will help you maintain better um, respiratory performance with age. And if you do smoke, stop as soon as you can because that will help you recover more and get back towards normal and potentially, you know, if you live long enough, not have respiratory problems, not end up being tied to an oxygen tank for the, your senior golden years of your life. Okay? Now, when we look at the lungs, we always want to assess how are they doing. And it's easy to just count. How many breaths are you taking? But what becomes more challenging is, all right, do you still have a normal amount of lungs? meaning do you have a tennis court worth of lungs, and are they working to the right compliance, to the right ability to take in air and not air, and can they enhance how much air they take in and how much they push out? So can we potentially calculate your residual volume, and is it a normal amount of residual volume or not? Okay, And so we can do pulmonary function testing to try to see if you are within normal range for the amount of volume of air you can breathe in and out, um, and the amount of air dead space Y your lungs has, um, or if it's increasing, okay? So this is what we want to talk about in lab this week, in addition to the, um, and we, we kind of hit on it last week, but we want to look at, okay, the old school way to do this pulmonary function test was the person put a little mask in their mouth, and they just sat there and were breathing, and the mask was tied to this thing that as they inhaled, uh, and suck the air out of the canister, the tube would actually um, would go up, and then the when they exhaled out, the canister would increase, and the tube would go down. So it was like a little pin moving on a paper. Okay? And what we found is when we let people breathe, they, most healthy, normal people breathe in 500 milliliters of air, and we've called that our tidal volume. But that's not the total amount of air a person can breathe in. They can actually take in more air if they take bigger in breaths using more accessory muscles. And we found that people can actually inhale about 3,000 milliliters or 3 liters more air if they incorporate more muscle into the movement and make the rib cage really move out as much as possible. We also found that when we ask people to give us an exhale and exhale as much as possible, they can exhale above and beyond the 500 they're moving another 1.1 liters of fluid, okay, of air. And we can calculate with these volumes that the dead air space of the conduction zone and the alveoli should be around 1.2 liters of air in a healthy, normal person. Anytime we take two or more of these volumes and put them together, we get capacities. So 
our inspiratory capacity, anytime we inhale air, that means we take in a normal breath of tidal volume of 500 plus an inspiratory reserve, that gives us an inspiratory capacity. If we look at what we could possibly move air into its maximal and out to its maximal, that's known as our vital capacity. And that is going to be tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, and expiratory reserve volume. If we look at just what is in the lungs with quiet breathing, when we're not taking in um, big amounts and exhaling out big amounts of air, we're usually seeing the residual volume and our expiratory reserve volume left in the lungs. That's our functional residual capacity. All right? The total lung capacity is all of these together. Okay? Again, residual volume, we calculate, we estimate that. Okay? And what we see is as we age and our lungs become less compliant, so we're less able to expand, less able to recoil down, residual volume is going to increase. All right? If we have disease, if we smoke, and if we kill off areas of our lungs that no longer, you know, get good air ventilation, residual volume is going to increase. Okay? Now, this is just some of the volume's capacities. We also want to see in our pulmonary function testing, when we exhale and when we move air, that we move it in a certain amount of time, All right? And so one of the other things you'll see in um, some of our uh, functional pulmonary function testing is how much air are we exhaling in one second, how much air are we exhaling in the 50, 25 to 75% of the exhale you know, of the time we're exhaling. And those are going to be our forced expiratory uh, volumes that we exhale FEV1 or FEV25 to 70%. And diagnostically, that's going to be important, the amount of air we exhale in a second, because it's going to potentially tell us if something is obstructing our ability to get air out or restricting our ability to get air out. Okay? So when we look at pathologies, restrictive diseases mean any condition where the lungs are not able to um, expand. Okay? So a restrictive lung would be a lung with age that doesn't have um, as much compliance. A lung that the bones are not as pliant, the cartilage isn't as pliant, so those lungs can't be pulled out. Right? So some examples of restricted disease are idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So there's a problem in the connective tissue related to our fibrous tissue. Uh, interstitial pneumonia, meaning fluid accumulates in our interstitial fluid, so therefore it's harder for the muscles to pull out and make the lungs expand. All right, sarcoidosis. Chest wall neuromuscular disease. Something is wrong with the neuromuscular junctions, the neurons being able to talk to the diaphragm, to the muscles of inspiration to pull the chest wall out. Okay, so these are our restricted diseases. So we can't pull the lungs out, so we see that residual volume might be um, normal, but all of the other volumes decrease. Okay, all right. Obstructive disease is usually there's something preventing the ability to get air out of the lungs, all right? And we have a reduction in flow in, we potentially have a limitation in air flow out, all right? So we might see that the lungs open, but we can't get the lungs to collapse back down, all right? So emphysema is this. Asthma is this. Asthma, again, we're moving air, but we're not moving large amounts of air. Chronic bronchitis, we're moving air, just not a lot of air in a given second. And COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Again, we're not moving a lot of air. And in this case, we might see changes of all, some of our volumes going up and then other volumes going down. Okay? So the amount of air total is not moving, um, but the lungs might be overinflated and therefore the air is not being able to, is limited in how much is moving in and out, All right? So that is the chapter on our respiratory organs, uh, our respiratory system, all right? Uh, we have digestion in lab this week and review next week. Uh, your test is coming up the following week. Your test is over lymphatics and respiratory. Again, do take a look at some of our um, 
pathologies because I am going to potentially ask you to pick a pathology and tell me um, why it would then potentially be a lung disease and why it potentially would change um, tidal volume or, vo um, or respiratory rate. Okay, so try to read up a little bit more on that. Jackie, do you have any questions? Because you're the only person in the class here live. I see you're typing, Jackie. I just I don't have, it hasn't popped up yet. Let me see. You want me to post these slides? Because I think these are some of the same slides um, that should be available to you at the very bottom of the respiratory lymphatic folder called the respiratory physiology slides. And they should also, um, oh, the whole lecture. Yes, after I stop recording, I will record the whole, you know, and it takes about 20 minutes. I will post it like we always do as that guest link, and it will hopefully show up within the next hour or so. Yes. It will hopefully get posted, because I know you showed up a little late. Thank you for coming. All right, I'm going to stop recording so we can start processing and get ready.